All right, we're going to get started for today. Again, I welcome you all to the National Housing Resource Center's Leaders in Housing Counseling webinar. Today is uh, Thursday, October 20th, 2022. Before we get started, there are a few things I want to uh, just go over with you today. If you can, please put in the chat box what organization you are with and where you are watching from. We love to see where our uh, uh, attendees are watching from. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. If there is anything that you miss in today's webinar, a copy of this presentation will be sent out uh, within 24 hours, along with a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Closed captioning has been enabled for this webinar. If you need to utilize this service, please toggle your mouse at the bottom of your screen and click the CC button. Uh, there will be a portion at the end of this webinar, at the end of the presentations, that uh, you can ask any questions that you may have for our uh, presenters today. If you can, please put all questions in the Q&A box and not the chat box. The chat box is consistently rolling, and so we don't want to miss any questions that you may have. So please put any questions that you have in the Q&A box. All right, we do also want to invite you to follow us on our social media pages. Let's get connected. So follow us on our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram pages. Those uh, handles are NHRC846 and on our YouTube channel, which is National Housing Resource Center. On our YouTube channel are all of our Leaders in Housing Counseling webinars that you may have missed in the past. You can always go to our YouTube channel and check out any of our webinars. We also want to invite you to become a member of NHRC. Your membership helps support the work that we do, and we'd love to have you join us as a member. And so here is uh, a question. Why should you join NHRC? And so we have several partners and friends and also members who uh, appreciate the work that we do. And so here's a quote from uh, one of our partners. It says, during a workshop group to help promote Section 8 homeownership, NHRC was able to help revert a change to one of the policies, which should have never been changed back to what it was originally, allowing homeowners to stay in the family self-sufficiency program. This is just one of the many things that we were able to accomplish over the 10 years NHRC has been in existence. And we want you to be a part of all the work that we do. So uh, if you want to join NHRC, you do have that uh, opportunity to do so. We have recently... Um enabled uh, a credit card feature where if you want to join NHRC or if you would like to renew your membership with us, uh, you can do so by credit card. I believe Christy is putting that information in the chat box right now. Um, and again, uh, this information will be sent out uh, within 24 hours uh, along with the PowerPoint presentation and a copy of this video. So why should you join NHRC? There are several things that you receive when you become become a NHRC member. You get discounts on the CoreLogic credit, credit reports. That's three different uh, credit reports you get for one low price. I believe it's $19, $18.88. You get also get a discount on the Savvy Online Student Loan loan service tool. Um, and you'll receive some information about that later on in this webinar. You also get notifications of unusual funding opportunity, opportunities and the satisfaction of supporting the work that we do to elevate and fund housing counseling and uh, housing counseling opportunities. So that's my part. I'm going to turn it over to Bruce Thor Palin. He's going to take it over from here. He's going to go over our agenda and lead us through the rest of this webinar. Thank you, everyone, and we hope you enjoy. Thanks so much, Ebony. Great. Um, so today we have, um, uh, so, you know, actually, I just should say first, let me welcome people coming on. I understand that we have some people who haven't been on our calls before, on our webinars before, um, and um, we are very welcome to. We do have a listserv that we maintain, the Leaders in Housing and Counseling listserv, um, and it's got 1,200 of your peers on it today, and um, if you want to 
sign up and and become part of that. Um, I hope we put that note in the um, in the chat box a couple times today. Uh, but do, please do that. That's how you find out about these webinars, but also a lot of the advocacy work we do. And and just to underscore what um, Ebony just said, we are really in the middle of trying to get housing counseling to be elevated in policy work circles in um, in the White House, at uh, HUD and Treasury, um, in Congress, in the House and Senate, um, and in, with lenders and in the um, uh, kind of in the whole discourse about how to uh, deal with affordable housing uh, renter or homeowner in this country. And um, we really kind of rely on pulling groups together and being a voice, um, certainly groups that are active in our organization get to jo join us in meetings with House and Senate representatives um, to help hammer out policy strategies. There's all kinds of opportunities we've got working on lots of important issues uh, today to increase home ownership opportunity, to address the issues of the race and ethnic um, uh, home ownership gap, to, to deal with all the kind of issues about uh, rental housing and access to affordable housing um, and issues around trying to increase the housing supply and make it more available. Um, we're deeply involved in the fight to um, stop pri um, private equity from really taking over first-time home buyer opportunities and, and uh, cash buyers outbidding our people and outmaneuvering them in the marketplace. Um, we're we're involved in all these kind of questions. And so more of you involved would be great. Um, so please be sure that you're on the Leaders in Housing Counseling listserv um, and that your staff members on it are on it as well. Um, and then of course, uh, um, thinking about joining NHRC will be great. And we'll do a quick summary of that um, at the end of the call today. But with that point, um, I'll do um, a few uh, quick updates on things we're working on that I uh, wanna make sure you all know about. Um, and then we'll jump into having um, uh, Christy do a, her legislative update. Uh, she's our housing policy director and we're working a lot in the House and Senate. And right now front and center are appropriations and getting um, more increased funding for HUD housing counseling. Uh, we'll have Eric Moore from our staff talk about the career path work we're doing right now to increase uh, the people who are looking at housing counseling as a job and as a career and what we're doing and working with others to expand um, the pool of people who can become certified housing counselors. And then LA will give us an update of a lot of other things that NHRC is deeply involved with. The main part of this call today will be on the new student loan forgiveness program that uh, the applications just rolled out um, today, um, I'm sorry, earlier this week. And um, we have our friends from Savvy, Lindsay Clark, um, uh, Cody Hunanen from S uh, Student Debt Crisis Center, and Natalia Abrams from Student Debt Crisis Center. These are absolutely, as you'll see, the experts on student um, debts, student loans. And we will have a broad ranging uh, conversation that will include the forgiveness plan and I'm sure much more. And they have a lot of valuable tools as well. This is important, we think, for um, your clients, but also for your staff um, and for um, for your family members as well. This is all um, pretty vital for getting people uh, in a better position for the future. There'll be some time for question and answer. I think we're expecting this to be a two-hour call. And um, we'll do at the end, uh, we'll talk about joining NHRC um, and uh, probably do a plug also. We've got a very interesting call um, uh, next week, which uh, uh, Ellie will talk about, but I think will also have a deep impact on our work and our ability to deal with affordable housing. So with that quick note, um, let me just dive in quickly on my part. And um, thank you everybody who participated in our FHA mortgage insurance premium um, uh, email uh, sign-on letter. We, um, it, we turned it into Secretary Fudge this morning. 120 organizations, about a third of them national organizations, and two-thirds local uh, housing 
programs uh, around the country. So really appreciate the very fast turnaround time. Apologize for it, but uh, you need to act. So here's the here's the opportunity. Um, as we all know, uh, uh, affordability is everything in the market today, especially with the rising interest rates. Um, we um, uh, felt like this was an opportune time to press the administration to uh, to reduce the mortgage insurance premium on FHA loans. FHA loans, of course, um, are uh, um, both um, government backed and or government insured loans, but also um, the most common vehicle for people of color buying housing, buying houses, and um, a clear leader in um, dealing with underserved markets. Um, so the, our proposal was to uh, decrease the mortgage insurance premium by 25 to 35 basis points. Um, it's uh, 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 historically, it's been lower than that. It was raised because there was concern about the, um, the housing trust fund. Um, that, that fund now has, um, sorry, the FHA fund. And um, that uh, fund is is doing much better right now. So um, now's the time to lower it, especially in, a, in an environment where rates are going up so rapidly. Um, the other thing is that we also included in that repealing life of loan um, on the requirement of life of loan on the mortgage insurance premium. So unlike with Fannie and Freddie loans with the conventional market, where if you have um, uh, uh, if you're putting in less than twenty percent down, and uh, you you get mortgage insurance, that mortgage insurance comes to an end typically in seven years. Or if you get to a place where um, you have your the value of your property goes up higher, and you um, are at twenty percent um, or greater uh, uh, equity share, um, with the um, recently the well, a few years ago. Um, FHA implemented a life of loan requirement for people who have less than 10% down. And that means that they pay the mortgage insurance premium, which is, you know, substantial. I think it's 85 basis points right now. You pay that not just um, until you get to 20% equity, you uh, pay it for the life of the loan. And um, that's a lot of money. And it means essentially, especially if it's for people of color um, where there's been um, less of a history of home ownership and wealth building, this is taking wealth away um, because it's uh, um, more expensive in this market and it, it would last for the entire length of the loan. So we put in a very strong letter, very clearly stating that we'd like to see life of loan on the mortgage insurance um, payments be repealed. And we're trying to encourage it both for um, uh, people who get new loans, but also for the existing loans um, uh, that homeowners have. And um, we'll keep you in touch on what happens there. We're not expecting a response immediately, but we're hoping something fairly soon will we'll get some good news. Um, you know, working on lots of other things. Um, right now, there's a whole, Christy and I have been working on um, the uh, uh, federal home loan banks. There's FHFA has asked for a review of the federal home loan banks. And um, right now, 10% of their money that comes in is set aside for affordable housing programs. Many of you use those programs. Well, it turns out that why the federal home loan banks really exist, what they in practice do is provide cheaper money for um, um, uh, banks and community uh, banks. Uh, uh, ostensibly for mortgage lending, but um, it's, uh, it ends up being that 70% of the money does go to much larger banks. Um, and it's not really clear that we're getting anywhere near the benefit we should. So we're calling for, instead of 10% of the profits being set aside for um, uh, affordable housing program, a 30% be set aside. There's a real public purpose to these banks and we really have a big affordability challenge. And so that money then could be used for, um, uh, for all kinds of increasing the housing supply, um, addressing, uh, providing more down payment assistance, a lot of uh, things that could be uh, much more valuable. And there's a great deal more. We're really trying to get them to be addressed more consciously around the race and ethnicity um, equity issues. Um, uh, Christy's done some poking around and there's ways that 
we think that they could be helpful on, on um, climate um, change and resilience. So a lot in there. And, um, you know, that'll be a kind of an ongoing project we, we work on with many others. Um, and again, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the call, we're doing some work around trying to figure out how to slow up these private equity companies from coming in and, and buying up the starter houses so that our, our people are having a hard time even finding a, a property that they can afford. I'm gonna stop there because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, and let me hand it over to Christy. And, and Christy, what's happening in Congress these days? Hi everyone, and welcome again to our webinar. Um, so as far as FY 2023 appropriations, currently in Congress, um, congressional leaders left Capitol Hill earlier this month after passing a continuing resolution um, right before the October 1st deadline. So um, with this, they are, um, essentially campaigning right now until the midterm election. So they won't be back in DC until after the midterms, but um, the continuing resolution is in effect until December 16th. So after that, they will have to determine whether or not a um, spending bill will be passed or if another continuing resolution will be passed. Um, so um, this is a time in which um, legislative offices are negotiating top line numbers and working on the spending bill itself. So we are weighing in with different legislative offices to ensure that we push for the $70 million towards housing counseling assistance. And right now I have meetings set up uh, in Mississippi, Iowa, Idaho, and South Carolina. So if you're a housing counselor in one of those states, um, please reach out to me or um, insert your um, email in the chat and I'll reach out to you so that you are able to join our meeting. Um, um, legislative offices really enjoy hearing from housing counselors directly on what's happening on the ground, trends, and um, program needs. So it would be great uh, if you are able to join. Um, and so, yeah, that's all that's happening right now. I will pass it on to the next speaker. And thank you again for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Morn. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for National Housing Resource Center. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we attended the Cheney University Career Expo, where we had a lot of exposure. Um, yesterday, we attended the Westchester of Pennsylvania University as well. And then in the coming weeks, we will attend the Cutestown University for their career day as well. Um, our job board, we have a couple of new positions. Uh, within the last two or three weeks, we've had 13 new positions uploaded. Majority of the positions are all located in New York. And we also have about 26 resumes for individuals to, for recruiters to review. Um, if you have any questions, please email me about our job board or any outreach programs that's in your area. Thank you. And I'll pass it on to Ellie. Thanks, Eric. So, um... Ebony, if you could go to the next slide. Oh, there you did. So one of the things I just wanna add about our job board is we've had a bump up in the number of resumes that have been posted. So there are now close to 30 resumes. So if you are a housing counseling organization looking for a housing counselor, be sure to check our job board and check the resume section. Uh, so just a couple of things, you know, Bruce mentioned our leaders and housing counseling listserv. I wanna, there's a lot of new people here today. And so if, this type of webinar is something that you want to be able to hear more about and, and know about different things that are going on in the industry specifically related to housing counseling and you are an organization that does housing counseling or does a lot of work with affordable housing. This link is the link to our listserv and Christy is also putting it in the chat box so that you can see it and you can sign up there and we'll get you on our listserv. Um, for those of you who are already on our listserv, if for some reason you haven't received our emails recently, please check your junk or spam emails. Uh, we are finding that often now that there's been so much security added since the pandemic that more often people are uh, ending up finding our emails in their junk box. So make sure you look for it there. If it's there, then, you know, whitelist us and uh, you may have to do it again. 
uh, depending. So just want to make sure everybody is getting all of the information that we send out through our listserv. We're always sending out really great things. Uh, Bruce mentioned that we have another Leaders in Housing Counseling webinar coming up next week. Uh, the registration link is right there, but this is all about some of the changes that are happening um, in the government-backed mortgages around using rental history in mortgage underwriting. And so there are some different ways that this is that these are being done, um, and we're going to learn all about that next week. We have folks from FHA, uh, from the Federal Housing Finance Agency, from Fannie Mae, and from Freddie Mac coming on to talk about the details of how they are using rental to help underwrite folks who have thin or no credit. Um, this is really important in the housing counseling industry. You're going to start to see people who are um, going to be uh, uh, having their rent reported um, in for Fannie and Freddie, where they have multifamily units. They are encouraging the owners of those multifamily units financed by that by their mortgages to report on time rental payments to uh, the credit bureaus. So these are things that are starting to come up. We're also, we also have Chi Chi Wu from the National Consumer Law Center, who's gonna talk about some of the things that you need to be thinking about to protect consumers um, who are um, having their rent reported and some things to make sure that your clients understand, that you understand and that your clients understand. Um, and so with that, um, I don't know, Bruce, did you wanna add anything about the webinar that's coming up next week? before we move on? No, I think this is, it's just, I think it's very important. This is information housing councils will need to know in order to be able to properly serve their clients. So this is all pretty much a new frontier for our work field. And um, we, we will do a very deep dive, but um, the idea is that this is a place where we, where you and we can expand the, uh, um, uh, the opportunities for people with thinner credit files and, uh, and it's also a way of getting our work and um, your clients into the automated underwriting systems so that uh, you're not forced into manual underwriting, which while we love manual underwriting, um, the lenders don't, and, and it's often a, um, a discouraging for your clients. So th this is a way that may automate some of our, our work. And you'll need to understand that there's big differences between what Fannie and Freddie are doing and what FHA is doing. We want you to understand these really well because different people will fall out of different parts of it if, if, we're, if you're not an expert on this. So, you know, tell your peers out there in the field as well to participate in this one. It's, it'll be important. That's it. So let, let's move on. I'll leave it to you, Ellie. Great. So um, we have a really uh, great presentation today. Listen, you all, many of you have heard from uh, from these folks at Savvy and at Student Debt Crisis before. They always do an amazing job of, of presenting this information. Uh, so with that, I wanna just go ahead and move forward. And I believe our first panelist is, um, is Cody Hunanen. Um, Cody is the executive director of the Student Debt Crisis Center. Um, and our other panelists today are Natalia Abrams, who is the president and founder. And oh, Natalia just messaged me. She's speaking first. So Natalia Abrams is the president and founder of the Student Debt Crisis Center. Uh, Cody is the executive director of the Student Debt Crisis Center. And Following them will be Lindsay Clark, who is the Director of External Affairs at Savvy. And with that, I'm going to hand it right over to Natalia. Great. Thank you so much, Ellie. And thank you all so much for joining today um, to learn about all the student loan updates. And, you know, we just feel for you as housing counselors, the more that we can free up money for your clients, the more that hopefully that can make it easier for them to purchase a house. Um, just hearing what you were talking about, Bruce, I I lost out to 12 bids last year due to all cash buyers. So definitely great to hear that you're working on that issue. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. So today we're going to go over um, the updates and this may be familiar to you, but what have, has been going on during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, student loan repayment, and loan forgiveness programs. And we will be talking about President Biden's new update on broad-based student debt cancellation. 
moving forward. All right, so over the past uh, two and a half years, since March 13th of 2020, payments for a majority of federal loans, so the federally held loans, um, have been on pause at 0% interest. Uh, payments are set to resume January 1st of 2023, so that's this coming January. The suspension time has counted towards public service loan forgiveness as long as you have been working in that public service job. So it's essentially two and a half years plus of free credits. Um, it also um, has counted towards default rehabilitation. Borrowers can recertify their income for an income driven repayment program. So we do know that about I think it's 6 million borrowers that have commercially held fe federal family education loans have been excluded from the payment pause. Um, I, income driven repayment still exists um, for those people. It still exists for all borrowers. If your client or you have had a change in income, that is when you want to take advantage of that recertification. Moving forward. So for the re for borrowers that have been in default, um, they um, also have received uh, benefits during COVID, which is that tax and social security withholding have been suspended. If in fact, you know someone that has not had, has had um, you know, their taxes withheld, you can always report that or complain to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or to the Department of Education. In addition, they have halted wage garnishments. Um, and then again, if you did have your wages garnished, you were entitled to a refund. This is all during uh, the COVID uh, period since March 13th of 2020. And, it, and lastly, collection activities like those awful calls and letters the defaulted borrowers have been paused. Moving on. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, now we're going to go over uh, a few important updates. So right now, um, loan servicers have been changed um, for uh, approximately 16 million borrowers. Um, they will still have a new federal loan servicer but the uh, Navient, um, Fed Loan, and Granite State have exited the market. Um, again, if you have a commercially held federal loan with Navient, that still exists, but they've exited out of the direct loan program. Um, so many of your clients or yourself may have gotten a notification that your loans will be uh, changed to a new servicer. Where this really matters is when it comes to public service loan forgiveness. Fed loan has been the servicer for public service loan forgiveness. That, as of July, uh, July of this year, moved to Mojia, um, which we know we've heard from so many borrowers that there are long wait times, there are count discrepancies. That's all getting worked out. But um, you know, Mojia is the new loan servicer for for those folks that used to have Fed loan servicing. Let's go on to update two. Um, in addition, um, there's going to be a one-time IDR account adjustment that still needs to happen. This is to address um, forbearance steering that has happened for years where, you know, a borrower will call and say, I am having trouble making my payments instead of telling them about income-driven repayment programs, which are much better for the compounding capitalized interest issues. Um, they are instead put into forbearance instead of an IDR program, which can also hurt their credit count towards public service loan forgiveness. This will also increase progress towards IDR um, income driven repayment forgiveness, but by conducting a one time revision of uh, income driven repayment uh, payments to address past inaccuracies. This is similar to the public service loan forgiveness waiver that we'll be talking about, but trying essentially to right the wrongs of these programs in the past. Um, they, the department feels this will re result in immediate debt cancellation for about 40,000 borrowers under public service loan forgiveness, and thousands more will receive forgiveness through income driven repayments, um, and millions will receive some credit for that 
cancellation or that forgiveness. Again, this is not fully baked um, or finished yet, this IDR adjustment and something that we will have updates for you in the future. Moving on. So now we're gonna talk about targeted debt cancellation and that is different than the broad-based debt cancellation that I'll talk about next. So this has uh, been going on since um, President Biden took office that we have seen um, a discharge of $5.8 billion for the students that attended Corinthian College. This went to 560,000 individuals um, who used defense to repayment. And finally, after years of um, kind of going back and forth, they saw their debt canceled. We also saw automatic debt cancellation for 323,000 borrowers under uh, total and permanent disability which was through data match with the Social Security Administration. And then additionally, billions of dollars in debt cancellation for students who attended colleges like ITT Tech, Arts Institute, and Westwood College, um, the for-profit colleges that you know essentially had scammed students or had closed down, to, uh, those students finally, or borrowers finally found relief. Moving forward. And the big one, broad-based debt cancellation. So about six weeks ago, President Biden announced that all uh, federal loan borrowers with federally held loans, um, and we'll get into that in a second, um, that make under $125,000 a year per person or $250,000 a year for married or family um, can receive a minimum of $10,000 in student debt cancellation. If the borrower took out a Pell Grant at time of borrowing, um, which is typically for low income borrowers, even if you took out $50 of a Pell Grant, you can get up to $20,000 in cancellation. The same income limits apply. And just to let you know, that's adjusted gross income of either 2020 or 2021 tax years. So happy we're having this workshop today because the application um, went through a beta test starting uh, last Friday and was officially launched this um, Monday of this week. To date, <clears throat> more than 12 million, and my guess is that's quite higher, that was on Tuesday, have already used the form, gone through it. It's quite easy. Um, the department is saying that if you submit your application, before November 15th of this year, then you will be able to have your um, loan, you know, either wiped out if you're one of the lucky ones that owes less than 10 or 20,000, but you will, they will be doing an account adjustment. So to, therefore, you, when you enter into repayment on January 1st, it will be at a lower dollar payment. And that is really key because we know that in the past, when we've done administrative forbearances, which technically this pause is, that borrowers are more likely to default. That is one of the biggest reasons that they are doing this broad-based debt cancellation is to ensure that borrowers enter either into no payment or a lower payment when payments resume. Um, and then lastly, the application will uh, be around until December 31st of 2023. So we have, you know, a little over a year, a year and three months to find 43 million borrowers and ensure that they get the debt cancellation that they um, are entitled to. Moving forward. So here are the loans that qualify. Um, there have been some discrepancies with this. So uh, they're all of the direct loans, the entire direct loan program, which are loans largely issued after uh, 2010. Some people do have loans before that, but we went to a direct loan only program after 2010. So that's always <clears throat> a good rule of thumb if your client has, you know, uh, just recently acquired student loan debt, then they, um, you know, probably have one of these direct loans. It includes parent plus loans. It includes graduate plus loans. It includes direct consolidated um, loans. Then um, other loans held by the federal government, the federal family education loans that are held by the government qualify. The commercially held ones don't after September 29th. And 
trust me, we know this gets complicated. And the same thing with Perkins loans, but all of the defaulted loans, if they're federal, do qualify. On September 29th, the department announced that loans that had commercially held fell loans that had been consolidated prior to September 29th counted any consolidation after the fact for those specific commercially held fell loans do not. A good way to know if your client has that or if you have that or not, if your loans were not included in the payment pause, then 99% of the time you're, that's going to be a commercially held FFEL loan. Um, also, <clears throat> so yeah, if you're, that was there, you know, if your payments were part of that, that means if you, you know, if you were making um, mandatory payments during the payment pause, then you probably have that older loan type. Moving forward. So a uh, spoiler alert, you have to apply for this debt cancellation. There will be um, automatic data matches for about 8 million of the 43 million people eligible. Those people are in college uh, right now and with a FAFSA data match or with an income driven repayment. Even so, we are encouraging everyone to apply, even if they are part of the automatic. If they are part of the automatic, they will be told that um, in a response. Make sure that your clients or yourself are only responding to .gov emails when it comes to cancellation. Um, and also, I don't know if I mentioned in the previous slide, but the cutoff date is June 30th of 2022 for the loan disbursement date. So this does ignore um, incoming freshmen are not included, but there are um, you know millions of in-college students that will be included. Moving forward. So the application is simple. President Biden said it takes less than five minutes. We have been hearing from multiple uh, borrowers that it took them 30 seconds or less. Uh, in fact, some people almost feel it's too good to be true uh, because it's one of the you know simplest government forms that they've ever uh, witnessed. So this application does require social security number, date of birth, contact information, and self-attestation of your of verifying income. Um, the confirmation email will be sent to you after applying through a .gov email address. Then um, at the Department of Ed will be verifying ed eligibility with some borrowers. They will be asking you know, um, additional questions. They may ask them to sign up through their FSA login or to provide financial documentation. Um, if needed, that will not be for all borrowers, kind of a spot check situation. Once the application is processed, borrowers will be notified and the servicers to apply the cancellation to the loans. I've already mentioned this, but just important, you only interact with communications coming from the Department of Ed at a .gov email address or your loan servicer. And we know that 8 million borrowers who have already provided income information through FAFSA, there will be an opt out period. Um, some people are choosing to opt out due to state tax issues and uh, you need to opt out if you do not want your debt cancellation before November 14th. Moving forward. So this is just a really something we really want to remind, especially you know housing counselors or anyone that works with a lot of um, individuals that have student loan debt. That cancel broad-based debt cancellation is not the only thing. I would say if there is any silver lining about there being a form, besides it being easy, is that we have the opportunity to speak with borrowers and then find out what other programs they may be applicable for. So, you know, there is still this public service loan forgiveness temporary waiver that Cody will be getting into more in depth in the next section, which expires at the end of this month. But if you speak to somebody that's a public service worker, they should absolutely be doing the public service loan forgiveness application along with the broad-based debt application. Um, in addition, we are 
entering into repayment on January 1st. If borrowers are worried or feel they can't make their monthly payment to let them know about income driven repayment programs. That's another section that uh, President Biden announced when uh, about six weeks ago that they are going to be making great improvements to the program. Also not fully baked yet, but borrowers should be entering back into more generous repayment programs. So it's great to remind them that there are these programs and also to remind them that, you know, payments are starting January 1st. So apply for that um, broad-based debt cancellation before November 15th. Moving forward. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Cody, to go over public service loan forgiveness more in depth than how to apply. Um, I'm sorry, just before Cody starts, I just wanna verbally remind everybody, please put your questions into the Q&A box. Um, there's a lot of really great questions going into the chat and I don't wanna miss them. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff going on in the chat as well. So I don't wanna miss your questions. Please make sure you put them in the Q&A box. Thanks a lot. Cody, go ahead. Thank you, Ali. And I, I see some great, uh, really intuitive and important questions. So we're definitely looking forward to answering those. Um, Natalia said it, uh, debt cancellation via the president's plan is probably the most notable and visible plan happening right now. But that is on top of all of the existing programs that have always have been available to borrowers and will continue to be available to borrowers. One of the most generous of those programs is the public service loan forgiveness program. And I'll get into the details here in a second. But part of the reason we have to talk about this program right now is that there's a very important deadline coming up at the end of this month that allows many more people to qualify for this program and for those that do qualify for them to get much more credit towards completing the program than ever before. So let's go to the next slide here. And I'll talk about the basics. So I'm gonna start with the program as it existed prior to this temporary expansion and how it will exist after the extension. And then I'll highlight some of the recent fixes. So Public service loan forgiveness started in October of 2007. And the way the program works is that a borrower must make 120 monthly payments while qualifying by working for a government or nonprofit organization. And after that time, a borrower can receive total uh, student debt relief. And to be clear, a borrower can combine 120 monthly payments cumulatively over time. This does not mean that a borrower must work for a nonprofit for 10, for the same nonprofit for 10 years. They can work at different employers. They can work at non uh, public service jobs at different times with gaps in between. It is all about a cumulative total of 120 monthly payments made towards their student loans while working for a public service job. Next slide, please. Now you might be saying, okay, 120 monthly payments, that is 10 years. Doesn't a borrower pay off their student loans in 10 years anyways? Well, if a borrower is in what we call the standard repayment plan, which is the standard plan available to a borrower when they leave school, then theoretically a borrower would pay off their student loans in 10 years and wouldn't really benefit from this program. So the real way to benefit is for a borrower to enroll in an income-driven repayment plan, or what, we'll, what we call IDR. And an IDR plan lowers your monthly payment based on your income. And by doing so, you maximize the amount of student debt that's remaining after 10 years that can be forgiven tax-free through the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Next slide, please. So I'm going to explain what were the standard rules for public service loan forgiveness. And then you'll see in a moment here how these have changed temporarily. So to qualify for public service loan forgiveness, a borrower must be paying back a direct federal loan. And that includes subsidized and unsubsidized loans for undergraduate studies, direct graduate plus loans, 
parents with direct parent plus loans can become eligible and direct consolidation loans as well. Uh, I listed here the repayment plans that qualify. Again, the 10 year standard repayment is eligible, but doesn't really make sense because a borrower would likely pay off for student loans anyways. So you really want to focus in on those income driven repayment plans as a qualifying plan. And when it comes to employers, all levels of government, all 501c3 nonprofits, and then a select few uh, critical public service careers as well. And to be clear, when we say all levels of government and all nonprofits that are 501c3s, it does not matter what your job is there. It just matters who your employer is. So I always use this example. You could be part of janitorial staff at City Hall. But if the government is your employer, you would qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Next slide, please. Now, this slide just reiterates that. So 501c3 nonprofits include um, charitable organizations, nonprofit health care facilities, nonprofit private schools, legal aid services. Um, and, you know, Bruce even put in the chat here, housing counselors working for HUD approved housing counseling agencies may also become eligible, may be eligible. And just a few government entities as examples, public safety workers, public health workers, public education, and any government employee, as long as their employer is a government entity itself. Next slide. Now, really just to get send this home, I want to show you what does not qualify under the standard rules. Uh, typically, other types of federal loans, like a federal family education loan and federal Perkins loans would not qualify. Uh, direct parent plus loans can qualify after consolidation. And any loan that's in default, so many of us are working with lower income uh, borrowers, uh, if they're so behind on their student loans that their loan is in default, that loan would not typically count for public service loan forgiveness. On the repayment plan front, we've got a list of repayment plans here, extended repayment, graduated repayment, deferment, and forbearance. All of these options are available to federal student loan borrowers, but these are repayment plans that the government offers that do not qualify for PSLF. And to be clear, a few other employer uh, nuances, government contractors. So if you work for a private business uh, that does contract work for the government, that does not count. Uh, folks that work for labor unions themselves, not, la not union employees, meaning if you're a, uh, a union teacher, that, that still qualifies. But if you work for the like administration of a union, that is a different type of nonprofit that does not qualify. Uh, 501c4 nonprofit political groups. Uh, and you can work for a religious school or institution, but time spent doing religious instruction, meaning on the pulpit, that does not count for this program. Next slide. So you, you may have already recognized, but with all of these qualifying factors, we had a lot of problems with the program over time. Many people would think that they were on track for public service loan forgiveness for years, only to find out that they had the wrong type of loan. They had an FFEL loan or Perkins loan. And the worst part is they would find out that they could have consolidated into a direct loan years ago and had missed out on all this time. We also heard from many borrowers who had no idea that some federal repayment plans qualified and others didn't. So borrowers would be in an extended or graduated repayment plan or perhaps deferment or in forbearance because they needed a lower monthly payment only to find out that those did not qualify for PSLF. And the worst part here is they could have enrolled in an income-driven repayment plan, which would have achieved the goal of lowering their monthly payment and would have qualified for PSLF. On top of that, there were all these other small technicalities and red tape that prevented many, many borrowers from getting relief that they should have. So on this next slide, we're going to cover what the waiver does. So we recently 
have the Department of Education introduce what they're calling the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Waiver. And what this is, this is a limited temporary waiver of the rules that allows all payments by student loan borrowers to count towards public service loan forgiveness, regardless of what loan program they were in and regardless of what repayment plan they were in. This also means that folks have been, who have been denied public service loan forgiveness in the past will have an opportunity to reapply under these new rules and qualify for credit towards their 120 monthly payments. Uh, the Department of Education will be reviewing some uh, accounts to apply credits and borrowers will also have the ability to have their PSLF determinations reconsidered by reapplying. Uh, and for some, particularly those in military service and those working in certain federal employment will automatically have credit counted towards public service loan forgiveness because the government will use information they already have on their employment. Now, the big thing is this waiver, this waiver is going to make so many more people qualify and so much, so many people have many more credits counted towards public service loan forgiveness, but it's only in effect until October 31st of this year. So we just have a few more weeks to help borrowers apply under these expanded rules. Next slide, please. Now we have talked about how you needed to have a direct loan to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Under the PSLF waiver rules, a borrower can consolidate their FFEL loans or Perkins loans and all of the time they had been paying towards the older loans that have been consolidated will count towards public service loan forgiveness. So let me explain this piece a little more clearly. A borrower who previously had an FFEL loan could consolidate to become eligible for public service loan forgiveness. But what would happen is that this new consolidation loan would be considered a brand new loan and they would restart the clock. Instead of having any payments towards PSLF, they would have zero. Now, someone who's been paying back one of these FFEL loans for 10 years could consolidate, become eligible for public service loan forgiveness, and have all of that time count so long as they apply under these new expanded rules before October 31st. Uh, similarly, um, repayment plans. If you had been paying under a non-qualifying repayment plan prior to this waiver, you could reapply ahead of October 31st and have that time count. Uh, also, the Department of Education is going to be more lenient about your payments. So borrowers used to maybe make a payment uh, several weeks behind, or maybe they were uh, slightly, the payment they submitted was slightly lower than what was asked of them, and they wouldn't have that payment counted. The Department of Education is going to be more lenient. Some late payments and some payments that were off will still count. Now, the employer rules haven't changed much here. Uh, you still need to work for a 501c3 nonprofit or a government entity. But what has changed is that a borrower does not need to be working right now in a qualifying employer to count. So in the past, a teacher who had worked for 10 years and should have received relief but had retired two weeks ago would be blocked from getting public service loan forgiveness because they weren't currently working for a qualifying employer. That is no longer the case under these temporary rules. So as you can see, this the whole process here has been designed to bring in people that by all means deserved and should have received relief, but were blocked because of all this red tape and complicated qualifying rules. So I'm gonna go through a few slides here and this is gonna be a lot of information, but my intention here is to explain a few scenarios that you might find yourself or a client in. So each one of these is gonna be uh, suggestions for different scenarios. So what if a borrower doesn't know what kind of loans they have at all? Well, they can go to studentaid.gov and log into their account and all of their federal student loan information will be held at a page called My Aid and a section called Loan Breakdown. There you'll find a list of each federal loan you've bought, that a borrower has, 
and even the loans that have been paid off or consolidated. So this is really a chronological tracking of everything related to your federal student loans. You can also find out there if a borrower has a direct loan, a Fell loan, or a Perkins loan, because it'll be plainly and, and clearly listed in their loan breakdown section. Next slide, please. Now, what if you have at least one federal loan and that loan is not a direct loan? Well, that borrower will need to submit a loan consolidation application and apply for public service loan forgiveness before October 31st to ensure that any previous payments under that loan that wasn't a direct loan qualifies towards public service loan forgiveness. Now, let's say you have a FELL loan that is, uh, needs to be consolidated and that is older, and you have another loan that's newer and you consolidate them so that you can become eligible. The Department of Education is going to use the date of your oldest loan to count towards public service loan forgiveness. So some borrowers with older loans are going to be able to see all of their student loan debt forgiven much sooner. Uh, you can start both of these processes right now. So a borrower can submit a consolidation today and also submit a new PSLF form today and get the ball going so they don't miss out on the October 31st deadline. Uh, and as a reminder, there is a tool to help you at the Department of Education. It's called studentaid.gov slash PSLF. And that tool can help you understand the program and learn about your eligibility. Now, what if you have a direct loan and you've already started this process with public service loan forgiveness by certifying your employment with the Department of Education? So what that means is a borrower has already submitted an application for public service loan forgiveness that says, I work for a qualifying employer and I want the Department of Education to start tracking my employment. Well, if you've already applied for PSLF and had some employment certified, the Department of Education will automatically award any additional payments without further action. So they're going to go back and they're going to reassess your status under these new rules and update your count. Now, the federal student aid, the Department of Education's wing on student loans, they may contact you for additional information. So right now is a time where a borrower uh, really needs to be tracking e emails and communications they're getting from the Department of Education or their student loan servicing company. Uh, you will get an email that says how many additional payments you've received. Uh, so all of this, these kind of adjustments are going to be communicated clearly to borrowers. Next slide, please. Now, what if you have a direct loan, meaning you already qualify for PSLF, but you haven't applied in any way? Well, now is the time to submit a PSLF form so that the Department of Education can review all of your loans under the new rules. It is not too late. If you just find out about the program today, or you're just telling a client about the program today, they can have retroactively any qualifying employment since the program started in 2007 count. But you need to submit a form before October 31st to be uh, under the new expanded rules. Now, I have to be very honest. There has been an enormous influx of applications at the Department of Education. So there are some delays. On top of that, Natalia mentioned how the student loan servicing companies have changed. So we're hearing that there's a lot of um, issues when it comes to communicating how many credits you're getting. So be patient, but still submit ahead of October 31st if you want to be eligible under these new rules. And what about someone who has already tried to certify their income, but they were denied? Now is the time to submit another application to see if you can receive credit towards forgiveness. There are a lot of reasons a borrower could be denied. One, it could just be error. Two, it could have been a, de a denying because of their loan type or repayment plan. So we encourage people to use this opportunity to reapply to make sure that any credit that could qualify is counted. Um, if you feel like your employer qualifies and you want to just double check, you can go to the Department of Education's PSLF help tool 
And there is some database of some employers there as well. And as a reminder, none of the rules related to which type of employment has changed here. You still need to work for a government or entity or a 501c3 or a nonprofit that provides designated public service work. I'm gonna underline this consolidation piece here because it is a bit confusing. Not everyone who needs to, who wants to take advantage of PSLF under these new rules needs to consolidate. People who need to consolidate are those who want to become eligible for public service loan forgiveness and currently are not because of their loan type. That would include Parent PLUS loans and federal family education loans. Uh, under these rules, you need to consolidate and apply before the waiver deadline of October 31st. I mentioned previously, if you consolidate and you had an old FFEL loan, any time you were making qualifying payments will now count for Parent PLUS loans. Unfortunately, uh, your credit count will start at zero. But if you intend to be working in public service for the next 10 years, you can still qualify. You can consolidate right now and start making progress. Uh, so now is the time to really take advantage of joining into the program. And there's a lot of reasons folks would consolidate. Maybe you want to become eligible for uh, a federal repayment program. Maybe a borrower is in default and they want to consolidate to start fresh. Uh, perhaps you want to combine your undergraduate and graduate loans so that you can be you can have your debt forgiven faster. Uh, there are many reasons a borrower should consolidate. Uh, so we encourage folks to go to studentaid.gov, learn about the process so that you can make an informed decision about what to do next. All right, just a few more slides on PSLF here. Uh, I wanna also remind folks on this next slide that folks who are interested in public service loan forgiveness have really benefited during the pandemic. As a reminder, Payments have been paused for most federal student loans since March of 2020. All of that time counts towards public service loan forgiveness. So a borrower could get nearly one out of five of their 120 payments counted during this payment pause for absolutely free. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Lindsay in just a few slides here who from Savvy to talk about the Savvy tool because the Savvy tool can help you ensure that you're taking advantage of all of the student loan forgiveness credits and programs that are available, eligible to borrowers. So last slide for me is this. We know there's a ton of issues. We know borrowers are having a lot of problems with their loan servicers. If you have hit a roadblock and you just cannot get your account properly adjusted or get your information from your servicer, there is a way to get help. The Department of Education Student Loan Ombudsman's Office can help resolve discrepancies with loan balances and payments and credit counts. They can explain loan interest and collection charges. They can identify options for resolving your issues. And they can even reach out to your student loan servicer to require that they actually respond to your inquiries. So we encourage anyone who's hit a roadblock, has a serious complaint or issue to contact the Student Loan Ombudsman's Office and below is their email. It's FSA Ombudsman Office at ed.gov. All right, with that, I'm going to wrap up my section on PSLF. I know it's been a ton of updates and information. So the good news is we are bringing our tool to the forefront uh, because the tool that Savvy's created can help borrowers just easily track all of this and enroll and apply. So uh, Lindsay Clark, uh, take it away from here. Great, thanks so much, Cody. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be uh, back uh, with you all today. Um, again, my name is Lindsay Clark. I'm Director of External Affairs and Chief Borrower Advocate here at Savvy. Uh, and we've had the uh, pleasure of working with uh, Bruce, Ellie, uh, and uh, the entire uh, NHRC team uh, for a while now, uh, as well as uh, our good friends and teammates at Student Debt Crisis Center. Uh, and really excited to uh, be able to talk to you about uh, the tool that we've developed uh, and service to assist borrowers uh, like yourselves and or members of your communities 
uh, with their student debt. As Cody mentioned, you know, this is a lot of information to consume in one sitting, uh, and it can be very overwhelming. These programs are very complicated, technical, and have an administrative burden that oftentimes prevents borrowers from achieving success. Uh, and so that's exactly why Savvy exists. Uh, so I'm going to talk just a brief bit about, you know, sort of who we are at Savvy, um, you know, what we do and, and why we do what we do. Um, I think it's important because there are, you know, are a lot of scams out there and, uh, you know, you want to know who you are trusting and why we are trusted by so many borrowers across the country. Uh, and then I'm going to, to talk to you about uh, the tool itself and show you how uh, you can access uh, this technology and platform uh, and uh, how it can assist you in navigating step by step uh, through things like public service loan forgiveness, as well as uh, enrolling in income driven repayment, et cetera. Uh, so we'll make sure that you uh, have all the information you need to be able to take advantage uh, of those resources. So if we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so just briefly a, a bit about Savvy. We are a social impact technology startup based in Washington, DC. And we were founded by policy experts and advocates who've been fighting on behalf of the borrower for almost a decade. Uh, and in 2017, this was the first year that borrowers could start applying for public service loan forgiveness. Uh, over 100,000 borrowers applied and 99% were rejected. Uh, and I think uh, Cody and Natalia have sort of very well explained uh, why that uh, was the case, these technicalities uh, that largely borrowers were unaware of and unfortunately prevented them from achieving forgiveness uh, and which these, this limited waiver has uh, sought to address. Uh, but our founders saw this and decided to do something about it. And so they developed Savvy as a technology platform and a service uh, to help borrowers not only better understand their debt, but actually navigate from start to finish and successfully cross the finish line on programs like public service loan forgiveness. Uh, but along the way, trying to make that experience uh, and um, you know, the, the process a lot easier uh, and uh, find any additional savings and lower those monthly payments as much as possible. Uh, so you know, uh, helping to enroll in things like income-driven repayment plans. Um, we're a registered public benefit corporation, which means it exists in our mission and charter to serve the public benefit. Uh, and that's exactly why uh, we do things like this here today. Uh, and with our uh, partners and communities of borrowers across the country, uh, we host educational webinars uh, multiple times on a daily basis um, because our, our true mission is to better educate and inform borrowers and ultimately empower them as consumers. Uh, this is why you, my voice might sound a little raspy because we've been averaging about three webinars a day, so I apologize. Um, all right, so I really want to make sure you all are able to access and understand how this, this works and um, that you can utilize it uh, to, to achieve the best outcome here. So on this next slide, um, I'm basically going to recap exactly what this tool does. You know, we're going to ask you a few simple questions around your tax filing status, your income, your employment, all of this will help us identify that optimal repayment and forgiveness plan for you. You know, basically down to the scent of what that monthly payment could look like and uh, how long exactly until you'd be eligible to have your loans forgiven and uh, the total amount, et cetera. Um, and then uh, you know, we offer a premium uh, paid level of service. Uh, so that, that's, you know, you can create a Savvy account entirely for free. Uh, but if you choose to sort of enlist our help, uh, with what's called the essential membership. Um, and again, that is a, a paid, a yearly paid service. We basically take on the administrative burden for you. So all of the application processing, submission, monitoring, et cetera, we do for you. Uh, and you also are able to, through that membership, get access to personalized support uh, with our uh, internal team of student loan experts. So sort of a dedicated agent that will be your point of contact to help provide peace of mind and answer your questions and assist you along the way um, through you know, these various enrollments and programs, especially given uh, how much things are changing and the new programs that are being introduced. Uh, so you can get started by going to nhrc.buysavvy.com and we'll put that link uh, in the chat. Uh, and I will say this, and Ellie, feel free to add if I'm missing anything, but uh, for those that are members of NHRC, there's actually a special separate link uh, in which um, uh, you can take advantage of uh, a sort of discounted price on that uh, essential membership and premium service. Uh, so I believe Ellie will uh, communicate the, that out to any members who are interested uh, and um, uh, they will have access to that link. All right, so on this next slide, 
I'm just going to sort of show you, uh, again, sort of an overview of, of what's involved in, in kind of onboarding and utilizing this tool uh, and what that process looks like uh, and how you can take advantage of it. So again, you can get started at nhrc.bysavvy.com. And I know we provided that link in the Zoom chat. Uh, and from there, once you sort of uh, get into the process and, and either log back into your account or register, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so you'll see your Savvy dashboard. And this is sort of like mission control for everything Savvy and student loans that we're going to be doing with you. Uh, it's where you're going to be able to do a lot of different things. Uh, so uh, primarily monitoring uh, the various applications that you might be processing uh, through and with Savvy. Uh, everything from multiple employment certification forms for public service loan forgiveness to an income-driven repayment application, uh, to even perhaps uh, your cancellation application as well. Uh, so we're able to sort of track your progress uh, and to help ensure uh, full visibility and transparency around where you are, you know, what still needs to be done. And also it's a way for us to help keep your servicer accountable. You know, if things are taking uh, you know, past a certain amount of time to process on their end, uh, and you haven't heard back from them yet, which is a common experience around public service loan forgiveness, uh, especially under this waiver. You know, bar, you know, members are uh, submitting forms and applications and not hearing anything for months at a time. Uh, very anxiety inducing. Uh, but this is where we can basically trigger, uh, you know, alerts and um, follow up with you and your servicer to ensure that you are uh, actually, you know, crossing the finish line and these applications are uh, achieving the desired uh, outcome um, because we're able to sort of monitor that with you. Uh, so it's uh, it's definitely helpful. Uh, we've seen for borrowers who um, many times are struggling to do this on their own, uh, but also are just concerned uh, that they've done everything they need to do, especially with this deadline approaching. All right, on this next slide, the process, as I said, uh, of going through Savvy is fairly simple. Uh, we're going to ask you some questions around your tax filing status, your income, uh, your employment, Again, all of that uh, is uh, to help us identify uh, with the highest degree of accuracy exactly sort of what you would be eligible for uh, and what that, that timeline is going to look like, right? Um, and then once you've entered in that information, uh, the last step of this process on the next slide here uh, is just syncing your loans. Uh, you know, there are certain data points around, uh, you know, your loan type, uh, your repayment uh, plan, uh, your balance, disbursement date, uh, many times the borrowers don't know off the top of their head. Uh, and so we provide uh, a loan sync through a technology called Plaid. Uh, and basically that allows you to, let's say, select your servicer, enter in your uh, username and password credentials, uh, and it syncs over a read-only snapshot of that data. So it doesn't give us access or anything like that, but just a snapshot of the things we need to know to be able to sort of further identify your eligibility. Uh, so, you know, Cody talked a lot about, uh, you know, how to identify what type of loan you have. You know, if you're still not sure, uh, when you sync your loans through Savvy, uh, we will be able to immediately identify if you have a loan type that would require a corrective action like consolidation, and we will communicate that to you and assist you with that process. So it really sort of helps to make sure that regardless of sort of where you, where you are and what you know or don't know, um, we're going to be collecting the information that we need uh, in a way that's simple and easy, and we'll be able to identify those things for you and flag it accordingly. Uh, and then once you've done that, uh, you'll reach on this next slide, sort of the, the final step here. And this is where we show you exactly what that eligibility uh, looks like. Uh, so you'll see things uh, like what that new monthly payment could be, what that total payment over time is, uh, how long exactly until you'd be eligible. I mean, down to the year and month of when you could expect uh, your loans to be forgiven and exactly how much uh, you might be eligible to have forgiven. Uh, you can expand below for more details. We might show you a couple of different plan options depending upon, you know, your repayment eligibility and things like that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you can uh, sort of expand and, and read more about these programs. All of that information is presented to you through the tool. Uh, and everything up until this point, you know, basically entering your information, you know, syncing your loans uh, and seeing these plan options is entirely free. You can access this, the Savvy tool through that NHRC site. Uh, entirely for free. Uh, it's at this point where, you know, the next steps would be to enroll and submit your applications that you can either choose to do that on your own, uh, or you can upgrade to that uh, paid premium service, which is called Essential. Uh, and that Essential membership would basically take on uh, all of that paperwork and enrollment for you. So on the next slides is sort of an example of what that looks like. 
uh, with the click of a button, and this is how easy it is, uh, you can turn uh, any sort of employment into an employment certification form. We sort of whip that up, uh, send it over to you through our DocuSign integration to sign off. And then we send it out to any of your current or previous employers for them to sign off. And we manage and monitor that whole process. Once they've signed off, uh, it goes uh, directly to Mohila via digital fax uh, and is submitted within 60 seconds. Um, and it's submitted accurately. Uh, I can't emphasize enough how Despite how great these, these changes under the limited waiver are, as far as you know, eligibility, uh, it doesn't change the fact that uh, 50% of all applications being submitted right now, still under this waiver, are being rejected for clerical errors. I'm talking things as you know, minute as uh, incorrect formatting of dates, okay, uh, or you know, typing your signature instead of signing. Uh, so all of those pain points and issues uh, we've accounted for in the process we've set up to make it easy uh, and almost impossible for that form to be filled out correctly by you or your uh, employer. Uh, so it uh, again, in one sitting, you know, let's say you had five previous employers that you're going to need to get signed off on before October 31st, you'd be able to basically, like I said, with a click of a button, uh, initiate all of those and get those moving. Uh, and then once submitted on this next slide, again, this is really where our dashboard and uh, sort of tracking and monitoring system comes into play. You know, you'll see here on the right, this is someone with three different employment certification forms sort of in process, uh, and uh, as well as an income driven repayment plan. So all of that, those various applications are monitored through their dashboard. And then on the left is sort of a zoomed in look at, uh, you know, how we uh, help provide that visibility and transparency to the borrower every step of the way. Uh, and, you know, they can clearly see where they are, you know, what they might still need to do, uh, et cetera. So it helps set those expectations uh, and keeps everyone involved accountable uh, and really ensures that you're able to understand, uh, you know, what's involved and reach that finish line. And then last but not least on this final slide here, uh, you know, our, our internal support team uh, of student loan experts uh, has, you know, I helped you know, so many people throughout this process. And I know uh, many borrowers uh, find it very compelling uh, to be able to speak uh, and work with a human being. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, again, provided in that essential membership is the ability to engage uh, directly uh, with our support team uh, and um, you know, benefit from their continued assistance throughout the process. Uh, and so if you do uh, upgrade to that essential, you can initiate a conversation uh, directly with them via your uh, savvy account. You click contact support uh, and can send them anything you need to. Uh, otherwise, we've got uh, a great interactive help center with tons of amazing content uh, that's been created uh, thanks to Student Debt Crisis Center. Um, and uh, that should be helpful in, as far as guiding many of you through this process. So again, you can get started by going to nhrc.bysavvy.com. Uh, and with that, uh, I believe uh, I will turn it back over to uh, Ellie, Bruce, and team. Thanks so much, Lindsay. We have a lot of questions. Um, it is 20 after two. We are probably going to go past the 2.30 time. Um, Savvy and student debt crisis folks, are you able to stay on for a little bit? Yes, yep. at Student Debt Crisis Center, we can stay on till the 45 mark. Ish, maybe 50. <laughs> we can go a bit over. Okay. All right. We will do our best to get these in. Okay. And some of them you may have answered. So um, uh, I'll just run through these. Okay. When will the student loan forgiveness be reflected on credit reports? Hmm, that's a great question. I mean, we aren't even sure when the president's debt cancellation plan will be. Uh, actually executed, right? So folks are applying as we speak, um, but we don't know a timeline for folks to actually see their balances zeroed out. Um, after that, I'm not fully aware of what the credit reporting timeline looks like. Natalia or Lindsay, I don't know if you have any experience on that front. We can look into it. Um, we can ask, um, like elevate this to the Department of Ed. And that's a great question. I don't, we, to my knowledge, we don't have an answer on that yet. Okay, that's great. If you get an answer, just let us know and we can get it out to For sure. um, our listserv. Okay. Uh, the next question. And I just want to remind people, if you put questions in the chat, I'm going to try to get to them. I know um, I know one or two people weren't able to access the Q&A. Um, but if you do, if you are able to access Q&A, make sure you get your question in there because I'm not certain I'll get to the ones in the chat. 
Uh, all right. So if someone paid off their student loans during COVID, are they entitled to the ten to twenty thousand payoff program? So that's an interesting question. If you so if to be clear, if you paid off your loan completely before the payment pause, then no, you can't get any money back. But if you were, if your payments were on pause, but you were, so it's only for the people that payments were on pause and you were making voluntary payments to try to pay your balance down, then yes, you, um, and your amount, you know, it's less than that 20, you can get a refund that's supposed to be automatic, but we are encouraging people, if you can get a hold of your loan servicer to request that refund. And I, you know, it's not a refund fund per se, it's like adding that money back and then being subtracted from the 10 or 20,000. And Natalia, okay. I just, just wanted to add a, a bit of clarity to that too. Uh, you would only be able to receive that re refund if you had not paid off your balance to zero. So it, 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 this goes with, you know, for any period of time, if you pay off your balance to zero, that's, that's it case closed. There is no going back. There's no sort of retroactive refund, retroactive PSLF, et cetera. Um, if you pay it down to $5, right, then you can, you could do that. Uh, but um, we, we've seen many people pay off the loans entirely. And unfortunately, you know, that, that's correct. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Great flag, Lindsay. Okay. What about those students that were in the Navient lawsuit? Would their loans be forgiven? There are some people with the Navient lawsuits with private student loans that saw complete relief, but for federal student loan borrowers, unfortunately, it, you know, it's kind of pennies, truly negligible in terms of that lawsuit. You're so no, and then your best bet is to just go for broad-based debt cancellation via the application. Okay. Yeah, I think the only uh, con extra context out there for those who aren't familiar is there are some very visible lawsuits against bad actors in the industry. And I get this question all the time, but so few borrowers actually benefit from that relief um, that, like Natalia said, it's, it's virtually negligible. So our work really should be focused on getting the 40 million folks who are eligible for this relief through the president's action and the millions of others who can qualify for PSLF. And just to be clear, like getting any relief for those who benefit from these, uh, these very niche uh, piece of litigation uh, that doesn't preclude you from still applying for all of these other things. Okay. What about students who graduated during COVID-19? Should they also go ahead and do income debt repayment, although repayment is paused? Yes. So that's a great question. So a person who has been a student during the pandemic, um, you know, they have these newer direct federal loans. So their payments after school would have been automatically put on pause. Uh, when payments resume on January 1st, borrowers will still need to explore all of the repayment options that have been available to them, namely those income-driven repayment plans. So a borrower that's graduated during the pandemic likely hasn't had to navigate the student debt space because they haven't been asked to make a payment. So it's really important that they know that they can enroll in an income-driven repayment plan uh, once they are required to make payments. And they could do so after January 1st when payments restart, or they could you know, theoretically apply for an income-driven repayment plan right now to lock in a lower monthly payment for the next year, even though their payments are on pause until January 1st. But these, these are very vulnerable borrowers in the sense that they haven't really had to learn or enroll in these programs during the pandemic. Yeah, and I was just going to add one, one thing to that, which is, um, you know, it, for borrowers who maybe they're still in school, right, or, you know, they, they just graduated, um, the, they should also absolutely apply for the uh, Biden cancellation uh, and submit that apl application because it's any, um, the sort of uh, eligibility is any loan dispersed up to June 30th of this year, 2022. So even if you are a junior in college, right, but you've had loans dispersed to you before that date, you can, you know, apply and qualify. So um, just wanted to, to mention that as well. And I'm not sure if this was mentioned in my section, but for those students, they will be looking at the their parent. If the student is a dependent, they will be looking at the parent's income for cancellation. Okay. I think there's a, there's a 
there's some question about parents that is going to come up pretty soon. So, okay. Um, uh, so a couple of things, I'm seeing things pop up in the chat. If you're looking for the link to the application, it was posted several times in the chat. So if you scroll back through the chat, you'll find it. Um, and then, yes, this is being recorded and you can find it um, on our website under NHRC webinars. Okay, uh, if the borrower received Pell Grants and then consolidated into a direct consolidated loan so they could get into the income driven repayment program, will they be eligible for the up to 20,000 forgiveness? Yes, even if you took $5 of Pell Grant, if you received a Pell Grant at time of borrowing, it doesn't matter um, what type of federally held loan you have, you will receive up to 20000 And when we say up to, it's up to how much you owe. So you won't get more than that, as Lindsay was talking about, but you are entitled to that 20000 Okay. If I have less than two years left on PSLF, can I also receive the 20000 forgiveness? Clearly, I don't want anything to interfere with my PSLF since it's significantly more than 20K. Correct. You yes. can do both um, PSLF and debt cancellation. One does not cancel out the other. All right. If Navient was your servicer, who's the new servicer? So if you had federally held uh, loans with Navient, meaning they're owned by the Department of Education, uh, those loans are being transferred to Aid Vantage. Um, now, if you had private loans or perhaps commercially held fell loans also with Navient, those loans will stay with Navient. So I'll use myself as an example. Uh, all my loans were with Navient, but I had a combination of direct, you know, federally held loans, some older commercially held fell loans and private loans also served by Navient. My federally held direct loans moved to Advantage. My private and commercially held fell stayed with Navient. So I now have two servicer accounts. So just want to make that clear. Uh, only it's only the federally held loans that would move uh, to a different servicer, but for Navient, it's a advantage. Okay. How does one find out if they received a Pell Grant in the past to qualify for the forgiveness? Yes, yeah, so you can find this out by logging. Uh, so going to studentaid.gov, uh, same place you would go for the uh, cancellation application, and logging into your FSA ID, your Federal Student Aid ID. Uh, and when you do that, you're going to see sort of a dashboard. Um, and if this is the Department of Education's official record uh, of any uh, federal loan or grant that you received. And so you'll sort of see two sections. There's one that says loans and there's one that says grants. If you click on grants, if you ever received a Pell Grant, it would appear there. So that's, that's the easiest way to tell. Okay. I will say, Lindsay, is it 92 or 94? Um, there, if you do have older Pell Grants, and I apologize for forgetting the date right now or the year right now, um, older Pell Grants, it be, you know, in the 80s um, and before that will not show up, but the department is tell, like telling us that they are, they still know whether you had a Pell Grant or not. Um, the best way to remember is, did you get a federal grant at time of applying if you were a low income student? This won't impact newer borrowers, but we are hearing from borrowers that had um, Pell Grants in the early 90s or before, and those are being reflected on their studentaid.gov. Yeah. And it's not like when in this application or in this process, you're going, you're going, they're going to rely on you being the, like the, uh, the, the arbiter of whether or not you had a Pell Grant, right? Like they're, they have that information. And so you'll never need to, if you had one, uh, but you just are still, you know, not able to find out, you know, for sure. Um you know, you will receive the 20K, right? So th they have the information if you did. So if you did get one, you're going to receive 20. You don't have to worry about, you know, not getting that because, you know, you're not able to confirm whether or not uh, you had one. So just to clarify on the process there. Okay. Is it the student that needs to apply even if they are dependent students? Yes. I mean, the students should be automatically data matched. We're asking folks to apply just to make sure you're dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's, but the student would apply, but they will be using the parent's income. Okay. If the student's dependent, just not all students are dependent. Got it. Okay, this person says they're struggling to understand the difference between IBR and IDR will both be qualified <laughs> for public student loan forgiveness. 
Yes. So IDR, Income Driven Repayment, is the catch-all term for all of the um, Income Driven Repayment programs. IBR, Income Based Repayment, is one of the Income Driven Repayment programs that absolutely qualify for both old PSF, PSLF, and the current waiver. Will the 10,000 forgiveness also work for parents who took out Parent PLUS loans for their child? Absolutely. Um, one of our team members, Sabrina, um, their family is receiving $50,000. So both Sabrina and her sister are getting $20,000 each, and their parents are also getting $10,000. So parents can get $10,000 in cancellation. Uh, how can we find the list of states that have the tax implications? Yeah, so I mean, that's a bit of a tough question. There have been some, well, just for clarity, what's what the question is asking is there have been some reports in the news that some borrowers in some states could be taxed for this forgiveness. Um, the problem is, is that there is no definitive list and it's actually changing as we speak. So I guess if you're curious, the best place is just to go and read the most recent reporting in the news. But what's going on is that many states who possibly could have taxed this forgiveness have actually come out and said that they will not be doing so. And so this issue is kind of, I think, being ironed out as we speak. Um, so yeah, I'm, Natal, I don't know if you've got anything to add there, but I, I I'm hesitant to tell someone to go find a list because it's a yeah. really dynamic issue right now. Well, I think what Cody is getting at. So for example, we're in the state of California. California was on the list <clears throat> at first as being potentially taxed. And then our California legislature said clearly that no matter what, Californians won't be taxed. So this is something that's still being decided. Um, and might not be decided for your state at the time of applying. I will say that, especially for low-income borrowers, the taxes are going to be negligible. You know, um, many people, it's going to be more beneficial to receive that ten or twenty thousand off. Um, but if you are concerned, I would uh, suggest checking with your state specifically. Okay, are there other terms after the cancellation goes into effect? What will happen to remaining balances if the debt cancellation does not cover all federal loan balances? Well, I mean, so those borrowers will still have remaining debt. And, you know, for them, what will be essential is that they are aware and take advantage of these existing programs. Uh, we talked about it shortly and we didn't really get to dive into it, but part of the president's plan uh, that was announced was not just the, the cancellation of this debt, but was the introduction of an entirely new income-driven repayment plan. Natalia mentioned that it's not fully baked. In the future, there will be an income-driven repayment plan option that lowers people's monthly payment even more and also addresses the issue of negative am amortization. So we, we used to see borrowers enroll in a plan, have their payments become so low that interest was accruing and they actually see their loan balances grow over time, even though they were doing everything uh, right. And so what that means now is that borrowers who still have student loan debt will be able to lower their monthly payments and they won't see their loan balances increase. So it'll actually be uh, a, a safer, more generous system moving forward for the remaining debt. Okay, I just I want to alert um, our attendees that um, uh, Lindsay Clark from Savvy did have to sign off. So there may be if there's any Savvy questions, I will save them aside and send them to her. Um, okay, what are some reasons that someone may want to opt out of the debt cancellation program? Or are there any reasons why somebody would want to? <clears throat> so somebody on, I think the person that might be concerned is somebody on a zero dollar IDR payment that already can't make their payments and can't afford any additional money taken out of their bank account, that person on the $0 IDR payment might uh, want to double check. Other than that, um, it probably, you know, having their balance lowered or wiped out entirely will still be 
more beneficial than not. Okay, and uh, any impact that the court cases are uh, having <laughs> on this program? Yeah, so I will say, um, you know, we get a lot of questions from borrowers about these court cases that are trying to undo the president's um, plan to cancel student debt. The Department of Education and the White House are moving full steam ahead, as we can see with the form and the plans to roll out uh, cancellation. So I guess the worst case scenarios we're looking at is potentially a temporary injunction, which by no means means the plan is undone. It would be a pause. Um, and we are awaiting information on the four uh, state attorney, attorneys general lawsuit um, in the next couple days. But even so, that will mean that the program's not undone and that there are what we're telling our borrowers and supporters is that even if for some reason they were to lose a court case, there are other remedies besides just undoing the program completely. So I think for right now, when in doubt, people should still keep applying um, and we will keep um, a lookout on any news with the lawsuits. But they don't, you know, to date, they really haven't shown any standing that we are all that worried about when it comes to the lawsuit. Okay. Somebody just, just right into the chat just want, uh, posted a clarifying question. So if you're in a repayment plan that pays $0, you might not qualify. No, no, that's not what I meant at all. I think the question um, for the commenter is that was the state tax issue, who might want to think about opting out? And it would just be that person, if your state is taxing you, you might not have any money to even pay a few extra dollars or extra hundred dollars on state taxes. Absolutely. Um, anyone with federally held loans can, ap can apply for student debt cancellation. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting one. This person says they work for a nonprofit, but it's ADP that does the payroll and they are not a nonprofit. My coworker was told she no longer qualifies for the PSLF program by her servicer. Is this correct? So it doesn't matter who the payroll company is, it matters who is paying you. So if it is a nonprofit, uh, C3 nonprofit, um, or a state government, local agency, or any critical public service work, that will qualify. Um, you can send disputes to um, the student loan ombudsperson, Bonnie Luttrell, if you feel that it's, there's an inaccurate um, inaccuracy. Yeah, but it has one, nothing to do. We use ADP as our payroll too. Not so thrilled with them right now, but we use ADP and that does not disqualify our supporters from student debt cancellation. Yeah, and I, I don't think this is relevant to this particular example because of the ADP mentioned, but I think it, it opens the door for something I do want to mention. There are some borrowers who have very curious employment situations. So for example, we've heard from borrowers who work for nonprofit um, uh, healthcare facilities, right? Nonprofit hospitals. And this is a borrower who would typically qualify for this relief, no problem. But what we would find out is that these, uh, some of these entities are staffed by third party staffing companies that bring their, their staff in and that their actual employer were these staffing companies. Right. And so those people found out later that they did not qualify because their employer happened to actually be some third party entity that um, that was really their employer for all intents and purposes. So that's a very like nuanced and kind of niche issue that doesn't come up as often. But this question, uh, you know, I think is, is reminiscent of that uh, scenario. So that's that's where you really want to find out who is this person's employer. And that will get you to the heart of the question. Great. And let's post that email in the, the chat again. We posted it once, but let's post the, the email for those kind of questions and complaints in the in the chat again. Um, somebody asks, uh, PSLF ends this month? Yes, PSLF is uh, the waiver, uh, the temporary waiver form, which lets to be clear that is the same as the PSLF form expires on October 31st of this month. 
we are still pushing internally very hard to get that waiver extended. Um, I think there is a tiny chance it could be, but let's not hope on that and push everyone to do it by the 31st. The Department of Education is saying as long as you have submitted your application and consolidated if you need to, there's only that small group of people with the FFEL loans that would need to consolidate that you do so. As long as you've done those two steps, um, you will be counted as part of the waiver. So technically people could find out about it on October 31st and begin their application, begin the process, and they would still be counted. So then public, the public service loan forgiveness program is coming to an end altogether. No, just the waiver. So the public service loan forgiveness will remain after October 31st, but the waiver, which it helps rectify the wrongs. I mean, it's, I think this confuses people because the waiver should be permanent, right? But it's not. So it's those people that had been in the wrong repayment program. If you were retired or if you had an older loan type, you absolutely should do the waiver before the 31st because they will do a proper count of your credits. So, okay. So an answer to the question, no, the public service loan forgiveness program does not end this month. It's the waiver Correct. for people who had past issues trying to get it. Correct. For that those 99% of people that got denied in 2017, <laughs> um, we have worked with a uh, so many retired teachers that not only got their debt canceled now through public service loan forgiveness, but got a refund. I just talked with a teacher two days ago that got $80,000 wiped out and a $17,000 refund. When in doubt, apply for all the things, both for PSLF and debt cancellation. So this question, I think that they are asking about the PSLF waiver, um, but I'm not certain. And so if this question came from you, because it's an anonymous question, if this question came from you, if you could put it in the chat to clarify if I'm asking it incorrectly. But again, I'm assuming this is about the PSLF waiver. Wondering if my application will become invalid after the deadline if I applied before the deadline. To be clear, the application was rejected because I was told there were issues with my application. I was told to redo and resubmit. I don't think I will be able to resolve this before 10-31-2022. Well, I mean, I think this is somewhat related to the previous question as well. You you will be able to still apply for public service loan forgiveness once this issue can be resolved. Um, but to be able to take advantage of the waiver, um, we will need folks to make an application submission ahead of October 31st. Um, I guess my question then would be like when they submitted this application that they said was denied, if, you know, if it was within the announcement of the waiver, then I guess technically they, they have submitted an application in time. But if this is like a much older application, uh, like prior to the announcement of the waiver, then you would want to get something submitted ahead of October 31st. Um, I'm, I, and I'm also curious to know what kind of reason for the original denial, because yeah. a lot of these issues can be addressed, addressed relatively quickly. And I will say we have heard from so many folks that have not, you know, that uh, did their application through snail mail, have not received any response, and it's been three, four, five months. Not that you should have to or your client should have to, but we are urging those people to apply again, just in case. So if it's been, I would say, three or more months and you've received no response, just apply again. They, they, the um, Department of Education stated that in September, they got more applications in September than they had gotten in the lifetime of the program. Just to, to give you context for how inundated they are. Understood. Okay, uh, this question. Um, they wanted to know, they work for a 501c4 that, that does qualifying work. Um, I'm working with a partnering organization that does advocacy work, hence the four status, but also does important service work, helping people connect to healthcare and so on. If someone, and so she's just wondering if there's it any way, qualify. there's no yeah, way around so, it. 
Okay. Uh, we do know people that work for both C3, like our organization is C3 and C4. It just depends on wh- the pay, not the payroll company, but which side is paying you. So like our employees are paid through the C3 side um, and therefore they qualify. But if you are being paid through the C4, thank you so much for the work you do. But unfortunately for public service loan forgiveness, that will not qualify. Okay. Okay. Uh, can an individual currently working a public service job be able to retroactively count time spent working with public service toward a cumulative 10 years for a qualified student loan they intend to take out in the future? I'm sorry, what was the in the future section? Can they, can they use the work they're doing now to count towards forgiveness on a student loan they might take out in the future? So not for a student loan in the future, but you can, um, if you're just finding out about this now, you can include past work retroactively, but it cannot be applied for future schooling. No. Yeah. And just to be clear there, the qualifying, the 120 monthly payments, you have to satisfy all of the qualifying factors during that time. Right. And so you can retroactively go, go back and say, when I made this payment in 2010, I was working for a qualifying employer and that counts, but you, yeah, you couldn't take qualifying employment and apply it in the future because when you made those payments, you weren't satisfying the other qualifying factors. So you, you have to really complete the circle every time you make a payment for it to really count. All right. We are at 247. We have so many more questions. There's no way we're going to get through them all. I think what I would like to do is what we haven't gotten through. I will, uh, put together and send to you all and, um, you know, at Student Debt Crisis and at Savvy. And uh, if you send answers back to me, we will get the answers out to our listserv and let people see what they are. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, well, thanks. And thanks, everybody, uh, all the attendees for all these great call or for all these great questions. And I'm going to hand it back to Bruce to just kind of wrap us up. Excellent. Um, So thanks, everybody. Thanks to our friends at Student Debt Crisis and at Savvy. um, And thanks for everybody's participation and your excellent, excellent um, questions. So this is the work we do. um, And obviously, it's all wrapped around housing and home ownership. And those pieces, um, you know, please, uh, we uh, would love that if your organization would join NHRC. Um, We've had a good year in groups renewing, but uh, could use a few more um, new agencies joining us. So, um, and hopefully you, your agency will be one of them. Um, you know, you, um, as Ebony walked through the very beginning of the call, um, we do the work to um, uh, really advocate for housing counseling. Um, and we are inside uh, many conversations um, in the administration and, and um, in the with HUD, occasionally with Treasury, a, a bit with the White House. Um, and we're submitting things to the White House soon that we hope that they will prioritize around housing counseling. Um, you heard Christie's work with um, in the House and Senate, which um, uh, we will continue to activate, actively work on appropriations issues, but also try to shepherd through other legislation as well around disaster recovery, around eviction protection, um, around uh, private equity issues. Um, all those kinds of things we will continue working on, um, regardless of what happens in the elections. Um, And we work really in um, the policy discussions that uh, affect lenders and servicers, all of these things. Um, And, you know, we really try to mobilize you all at different times, including we began at the beginning of the call with the effort to get FHA to reduce its mortgage insurance premium and end the life of loan payments. Lots of sign-on letters like that that are very helpful for you all to jump in. Um, we also have those groups that join. Um, we have a, a, a discount on CoreLogic Cred Co's credit report. So you get the, it's a tri-merge credit report and uh, three credit scores. It's a soft pull. It is what, um, it's the most commonly used uh, credit um, pulling agency in the country. Um, and uh, there's a substantial discount on that uh, for members of NHRC. Um, um, there's the Savvy program and um, a lot of the good stuff is free and you should absolutely use it. But uh, the, um, uh, I believe it's $50 for 
um, if you want them to provide the service file, the fees, and remind you about what needs to be done going forward, especially if you're on the public service loan forgiveness, you want every year to document your year year of um, service. And that really helps um, at the point when um, you've gotten through your 10 years. Uh, we do find some interesting funding um, opportunities that are kind of outside of the mainstream, so not the usual um, uh, things that, that you might see, um, sometimes big ideas, sometimes more, more um, um, localized. And so we'll, we'll shoot some of those to you uh, if you're a member organization. Um, you know, and the real thing is you're supporting the good work we all do and, and we're trying to pull together. So um, we really thank everybody who's been part of it. Um, the, um, uh, you, can, um, you can see there's a, 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 the membership blank right there. Um, you go to our website and you can pull down the, uh, um, uh, the membership form, um, you know, and, and it's tiered, the pricing of the dues are tiered towards the size of the organization. So um, with that, I want us to uh, just move quickly to um, uh, next week. Um, we are going to do one as Ellie walked us through a little bit on how, uh, on how to handle rental payments. There's some big changes happening in the industry and we, um, we need you to understand this really well as a housing counselor. This is gonna be an essential set of tools for people that have thin credit files and there's ways to document and include people's positive rent histories. Um, and it's dramatically different from what Fannie and Freddie are doing with what FHA is doing. And so you'll want to understand the nuances uh, because it'll really affect what, which, where your clients should be going in, in each of these packages. But it is part of the work we've been doing to try to get housing counseling to be more built in and integrated into the um, the uh, mortgage process. You know, you're doing a lot of work around technology to create standard data fields. Um, uh, we just this summer got, um, finally got the um, our housing counseling data fields and um, language preference included in the mortgage process for Fannie and Freddie. We expect FHA to do the same. You know, we do all this, this kind of work um, and uh, we wanted you all to um, uh, learn the basics on uh, on what's happening on the next session. So um, and that'll be next Thursday. And um, if you've just signed up for the Leaders in Housing Counseling listserv, uh, you'll get a, a notice um, on Monday for it as well. Um, so you'll be able to sign up for that call. Um, and we're planning lots of other very interesting ideas out there for ones in the future. So with that, I think we're gonna close out. Um, thank you everybody for, uh, a great call and we will be eager to talk to you next week. We'll get the signed letter out with 120 groups that signed on to Secretary Fudge that that should go out shortly and, and keep an eye out for it. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue doing the work we do and we're really pleased that you're doing the work you're doing. We know that uh, it's really powerful stuff. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.